despite others' attempts to identify a certain number with Satan, it will be known that nine is his number. Nine is the number of the ego, for it always returns to itself. No matter what is done through the most complex multiplication of nine by any other number, in the final equation, nine alone will stand forth. In nomine Dei Nostri Satanas Luciferi Excelsi, in the name of Satan, the ruler of the earth, the king of the world, I command the forces of darkness to bestow their infernal power upon us. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth from the abyss by these names. Welcome to this very special episode of Nine Cents. This is the fifth Greater Magic episode. Joining me for this incredible discussion is Witch Aaron from Down to the Crossroads. How are you? I'm super duper. I'm so honored to be here. This is going to be a really amazing episode and truly original. It is October 25th and we have a fantastic show for you this week. For five years now, we've been discussing the most controversial satanic concept in depth with members of the Church of Satan. In 46 Anno Satanus, I spoke with Reverend Bill M. and Warlock Storm about the practice of greater magic. In 47 Anno Satanus, I sat down with High Priestess of the Church of Satan, Magistra Nadramia, and Citizen Nanaya Asema to discuss greater magic from a feminine point of view. In 48 Anno Satanus, I spoke with Magister Nemo about the fringe ideas around greater magic, including supernormal human abilities. And lastly, in 49 Anno Satanus, I was joined by High Priest of the Church of Satan, Magus Peter H. Gilmore, and Magister Rose to discuss the customizing and creation of your own greater magic rituals and ceremonies. Now this year, I reached out to you, the audience, and asked you to share your greater magic successes and or failures, and you came through in spades. Now, we won't have time to cover every submission, but we will discuss the majority, broken up by Nine Cents contributor stories as well. So, uh, Aaron, are you ready to dive headfirst into this episode? I've never been more ready. <laughs> Let's begin. The definition of magic from the Satanic Bible reads, the change in situations or events in accordance with one's will, which would, using normally accepted methods, be unchangeable. There are three types of ceremony incorporated in the practice of Satanic magic. Each of these correspond to a basic human emotion. A sex ritual is commonly known as a charm or spell. The purpose in performing such a ritual is to create desire on the part of the person whom you desire or to summon a sex partner to fulfill your desires. A compassion or sentiment ritual is performed for the purpose of helping others or helping oneself. It may be said that this form of ceremony could fall into the realm of genuine charity, bearing in mind that charity begins at home. A destruction ritual is used for anger, annoyance, disdain, contempt, or just plain hate. It is known as a hex, curse, or destroying agent. We need to always remember when discussing greater magic, and I've spoken to this in past episodes and all of the guests that have joined me have uh, reinforced this idea, but it's important to recognize it was originally put down in the Satanic Bible by our founder and the individual who codified Satanism, Magus Anton Zander LeVay. Uh, he says in the Satanic Bible, these formulas are to be adhered to as applying the wrong type of of ritual toward a desired result can lead to trouble of a complicated nature. We're going to see that in some of the stories represented by some of the listeners and some of Nine Cents contributors. And there's another one here I want to really reinforce. It must be remembered that it matters not whether anyone attaches any significance to your workings, so long as the results of the workings are in accordance with your will. Whenever someone is first introduced, and Aaron, I'm going to ask you uh, your personal experience on this too. Whenever someone is uh, introduced 
to the idea of greater magic. There's this mystical idea of magic that they've grown up with through fairy tales and movies and any fictional or non-fictional book that deals with the idea of witches or witchcraft or magic or the occult. That there's this complex series of, of ancient knowledge uh, that one must, uh, one, be awoken to and then follow line by line in order to have a desired result. Anton LaVey is really wonderful in that he deconstructs the mystical side of it and he gives you some really basic steps, acknowledging that human beings love ritual. It is a part of what makes us human, uh, these, these ritual trappings that we connect with, and really makes it direct into the point of what you want through the ritual and uh, allows it to happen without trying to overanalyze or explain it away. Uh, he gives this really wonderful example of science in magic. Throughout all of history, science has been seen as magic until one discovers the principle that is behind said magic, whether it's gravity or lighting fire with flint and steel. Uh, he openly admits that some of the elements that we refer to in greater magic may never be discovered in science and there may never be a firm grasp understanding of but it's not important what is important is the results that you see as a magician um, so Aaron when you were first introduced to the idea of magic uh, in Satanism were you turned off or or sort of excited by it how did you experience it well, personally, I was a little turned off by it. And I think that has, it speaks volumes about who I am as a person. I think last time we talked, uh, we were talking about um, Halloween and dressing up and like that doesn't appeal to me. Like theatrics, I'm a very introverted person. I'm a very um, self-conscious person. I don't like attention drawn to me necessarily unless, you know, I have a specific reason for it. Mm -hmm. um, so like the idea of like theatrics and things like that, like it intimidates me and it's sort of my initial response is to be turned off by it. <laughs> but, but I, but you, you know, part of being a Satanist is getting over your shit, you know? <laughs> and so that's one thing, like, I was like, oh, at first when I heard about this, you know, greater magic, uh, and, and really read about what it was supposed to be, I was kind of like, ah, that's, I don't know if that's for me. And that for a long time, that was a real stumbling block in my complete acceptance of of satanism you know um because i read and, and knew and participated in in satanism in many aspects of my life but for that was the one thing where i was like i don't know if i can get over this get over my own shit to accept that this you know what this is but then the more i read the more people i talked to the more i understood that it you know it, it served it has a function and it's it you know for me greater magic's main function and i'm you know, paraphrasing someone's words here for sure, but it's to take all the the emotion <clears throat> and and can and change it into so, into real action. You know, um, and so once I absorbed and, and really understood what garden magic was, I was able to to use it. Mm -hmm. It's were you ever con concerned with? Um, because I think this is part of a stumbling block, which is why I mm -hmm. asked. Were you ever concerned about? Uh, seeing tangible results of the uh, ritual or the 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 act of ritualizing uh, through the lens of satanic magic you mean consequences as far as like detrimental consequences like things would go get go out of hand or something like that well no more more in the line of uh seeing the results of it like was there any point in doing it yeah um yeah but i'm sure that crossed my mind it was one of the things but um but I do believe in the power of the mind. You know, I do believe mm -hmm. that we are, uh, there's so much about our brains and our consciousness that we don't understand that, or, or psychologically, that we are, you know, still only now discovering that I, mm -hmm. I, I'm fully open to, um, you know, the workings of the mind and what, what is possible when we work toward those things actively. I think it's important to recognize that, um, and, I'm, and so I'm going to double down a little bit on that uh, mm. statement you just made, because I, I'm a fan of science and I'm a fan of 
truth through science, not mysticism or pseudoscience, though I do enjoy pseudoscience personally. Um, but I, I recognize it as such. And so for me, when I think of uh, the human mind and ca- capability, I always defer to like neuroscientists because mm-hmm. they're the ones on the cutting edge of understanding of the human brain. And they reiterate exactly what you just said, Aaron, in that we re- that's our mind or the human brain is really the last frontier of human understanding. Mm-hmm. You know, we've mapped a genome. Mm-hmm. We understand physiology. But the complex nature of psyche, ego, and just our mind, it's mm-hmm. still unknown. Um, I mean, we know a lot about it, but we don't know everything about it. And so when we think of of actions that are very much psychologically driven, we call it psychodrama, like ritual, Mm -hmm. you know, the understanding of our brains would be that sort of cusp of understanding ritual because we're using our own minds and will uh, in order to make change that otherwise would not happen in the world. Mm-hmm. the definition of, of magic. Yeah. So um, I think it's really important to, to recognize that, but not go so far as to struggle through, well, if we don't understand it yet, I shouldn't be, you know, I, I, I can't wrap my head around why it would work or why it does work or why it could work. Or, it doesn't matter. If, if you have something to get over, we have tools in place mm-hmm. uh, to practice and greater magic is that tool. And it's, in my opinion, uh, an essential and wonderful one. Um, do you think that popular culture, especially because we grew up really heavily in the 80s and in the 80s, you had your satanic panic, you had movies that were uh, explaining Satanism as uh records being played backwards and you know movies like the gate where devils were coming up from the earth if you just uh you know played a specific piece of music or read a specific passage out of a book that make it look really hokey and stupid do you think that that informed your uh initial uh um i don't know if it disdain is too harsh of a word but trepidation maybe trepidation toward thank you towards greater magic Absolutely. I mean, I am definitely a product of my environment and I definitely grew up, um, you know, first of all, I grew up watching horror movies and like you said, surrounded by the satanic panic at the time. It was at a fever pitch when I was young Mm and, um, oh, for sure. I mean, it was just everywhere and I, I loved it so much, you know, Mm -hmm. but, but there was definitely like, but at the same time, I knew like the people that they were calling Satanists were dipshits. You know? <laughs> they weren't true Satanists. And even though I didn't know what a true Satanist was, I knew that they weren't. I knew there was no th- such thing as the devil. I knew they weren't worshiping the devil. Um, but of course, there was that thought, well, they don't know that. You know, they're yeah. still acting as if there were a devil and that is terrifying. So, yeah, you know, definitely there was a turnoff from just the, the, that type of person. I was like, well, I don't want to that's I don't want to be like that. Those people are mm-hmm. fucking weird. Um, but at the same time, very, very compelled and very drawn to it. So, yeah, it's it, I, I was the same way. And um I would say I I took a <laughs> a turn where you sort of stayed on course of of mm-hmm. being a little um, uh, wary of the idea of satanic magic because I was very much into that idea of the occult. I saw it as goofy through '80s media and through mm-hmm. music, but I love the idea of of a connection to ancient knowledge. That mm-hmm. was really exciting to me. And though I don't see satanic magic in that way, um, I do very much still see it in the same family of an idea. Uh, Mm -hmm. It it is a way for me to manipulate my environment, and I'll be damned if I don't exercise my will on those around me or my environment. That's (laughs) what is satanic. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, part of this episode is our own experience. Uh, But what I would like to do is open this up to the listeners and other contributors, and maybe you and I can talk about some of the ideas that some of these individuals um, bring out in their explanations or in their uh, stories of their successes or failures. Uh, Would you be open to that? Oh my god, I can't wait to mock these people. (laughs) That's not what I meant. (laughs) Oh, oh, sorry. No, that's not what I meant either. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with lust, of course. Why? Where else could we start, really? And uh, we're going to start with 
our own Reverend Merciless. Come forth, O great spot of the abyss, and make thy presence manifest. I have set my thoughts upon the blazing pinnacle which glows with the chosen lust of the moments of increase and grows fervent in the turgid swell. A word of warning concerning sex or lust. Take full advantage of spells and charms at work. If you be a man, Plunge your erect member into her with lascivious delight. If you be a woman, open wide your loins in lewd anticipation. Ritual Magic by Reverend Merciless Yeah, I have a few things to say about the performance of satanic ritual magic. First, I will defy the opinion of a lot of my fellow Satanists and give my personal opinion that one is not truly a Satanist until one is performed ritual. This will rub a lot of fellow Satanists the wrong way, but I do feel the ritual is an essential element of practicing Satanism as a religion. The Satanic Bible lists three types of ritual, destruction, lust, and compassion. Other writings have suggested the use of another type of ritual, the dedication ritual. This is not particularly defined, but can easily be crafted from the obvious components such as the baptism ceremonies. So for a Satanist new to the religion and wishing to dip into ritual, but not feeling particularly destructive, lustful, or compassionate, a simple dedication or self-baptism ritual is something I highly recommend. Personally, I've achieved some stunning outcomes in the practice of destruction, lust, and compassion rituals. Let me share lust with you now. I had a girlfriend with whom my relationship had been rather rocky, and I had come to the conclusion that, while pleasant, it was not good for either of us. At the same time, I had fixed in my mind the sort of girlfriend that I wanted next. I had a fairly specific list of desired traits. Through online dating sites, I had identified a handful of possible women, but no one specific woman. Still, my emotional investments in the need for the change got to the point that I felt like ritual was appropriate. I formulated the ritual with a fairly high degree of specificity about the outcomes I sought. A smooth transition for both of us out of the current relationship and the attraction of a woman fitting a rather demanding set of criteria. Because I saw this as a rather complicated goal of the ritual, I made the ritual more elaborate than the basic form by elaborating, customizing, and expanding on virtually every sentence and concept of the ritual. I paid excruciating attention to the five elements of satanic magic, desire, timing, imagery, direction, and the balance factor. After the ritual, I felt as if everything had been set into motion, and it had. The current relationship ended and quickly transitioned into a fairly positive long-term friendship that endured to this day. And within a few weeks, a date with a new woman meeting all of my criteria that spiraled quickly into a wonderfully rewarding relationship, as wide and as deep as I had been seeking. About six months into that relationship, I even told her that she was not fully in the relationship of her own free will, but that she had, in fact, been charmed by my magical ritual. She smiled, hugged me, and said she was good with that. She remains an important part of my life. That was fantastic. Uh, Reverend Merciless really cuts to the core of uh, what he wants to say. No playing around. Let's hear from one of the listeners here, Citizen Phantasma. Hello, my fellow Satanists. This is Citizen Ray Phantasma, and I want to tell you about a successful, greater magical working of mine. Mind you, my fiancé and I were growing distant, and a rift had come between us. We were under a tremendous amount of stress and were fighting constantly. So I said to myself, it's time to put this baby to bed. Literally. So I employed a lust ritual and needless to say, it put the fire back in our relationship and alleviated that stress. So without further ado, my fellow Satanists, take care. Keep warm this Samhain season. Light not. Let your Luciferian flame of pride burn ever so brightly. And hail Satan. Okay, Aaron, so what do you think? This is taking a lust ritual in a very different direction. Traditionally, lust rituals are to draw a partner to you. This was to reinvigorate a relationship. Um, do you think that, uh, that this is an appropriate form of this ritual? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that lust ritual is appropriate at any time. <laughs> any time that you <laughs> feel lust for somebody that, you know, yeah. that you're, you know, that you want to, you know, get lust with, have, lu- have all- lusty yeah. feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that idea. I I never call me stupid. I always figured lesser magic would be a, a more appropriate way of dealing with it if you were already in the relationship. You know, applying a little bit of uh, individual technique. But the idea of applying ritual to an existing relationship in order to reinvigorate, I think is it's a bit of a different way of approaching it. Why do you think se- just talking about sex rituals is is a little uh, taboo. Um, I, I don't know. Do you think it's like a the the hokey factor? Do you think there's any sort of like, oh boy, really? I think a lot of like it is a, embarrassment. Yeah. Well, sure. I think I can't even. For some reason, I'm even like blushing just talking about <laughs> it. Like I don't know. It seems so personal to me. I think that that's part of it. But I think this guy's genius. I think <laughs> that was a really smart move. Yeah. It's a very creative well, use of his talents. One thing I really appreciate about um, the listeners in Ninth Sense, and uh, w- you know, one of the reasons why I, I asked you, um, you've been with me on this journey through Ninth Sense longer than any other contributor. Mm-hmm. Um, we have heard from the audience in the vast scope of their acceptance and understanding of this <laughs> podcast, and for them to come and share some really intimate ideas like a sex or lust ritual Mm -hmm. i think it's uh i'm I'm really honored by it yeah i mean for me it would be really hard for me to share like you know me and my wife did you know i know (laughs) i i throw out comments every once in a while goofing and sort of tongue-in-cheek but it's never like an actual thing that has occurred that i Uh i take that kind of stuff really personally Uh And I don't really like to share it openly and honestly. So, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like to even talk about it. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe even as a major barrier to entry of performing a sex ritual. Yeah. Um, do I you think, think that, uh, this may be a little weird, but do you think that men are more likely to perform a sex, sex <laughs> ritual than women? Oh boy, no, I don't think so. I, I, for some reason, I, I picture women, but the, okay. So men, t- <laughs> so the point of like, oh, so the ritual you intellectualize beforehand, but then mm-hmm. when you're actually in the ritual chamber, it's all emotion. You leave the intellect at the door. Um, and I think that men, I mean, they almost don't intellectualize sex at all, <laughs> <laughs> but of course I'm generalizing this ridiculous, but especially, and especially satanic you know satanist men they they're smarter than most you know they do know that they do intellectualize sex and lust differently and maybe um but i think part of the problem maybe with greater magic and just the discussion of greater magic is that it's like sort of the one time where you have to really take this seriously you know you i mean it doesn't have to be serious but you have to believe like that's the mm-hmm. kind of the whole point is that you have to buy in fully and suspend your disbelief fully and i think it's hard to talk about something like that especially for someone like me who it, i <laughs> there's very few things in life that i take seriously you know and mm-hmm. there's very few taboos or sacred cows in my life like talk about we can I can laugh about just about anything, but with greater magic and in the ritual chamber and stuff like that, and rituals, like the whole kind of point is to take it seriously and invest completely. And I have a hard time doing that because I just want to laugh. Like I was the the jerk who was like when we were trying to do like the Ouija board, I was the one that was like giggling and couldn't take it <laughs> seriously. You know, I, was, I kind of ruined every ritual. That's probably part of the reason why I don't. <laughs> participate in that group rituals and things like that because i'm such a dipshit like (laughs) (laughs) but i think i don't know men and women but then women you know i don't know does that answer your question i just think it's so hard (laughs) it's so hard to talk about yeah well i mean so the the original question was do you think men are uh, more likely and no you you said just flat out no you don't (laughs) think they are and it's interesting because obviously we come from very different gender perspectives Mm -hmm. um and I think because, you know, I where maybe it's because of where I was raised, maybe it's just the type of people that I was raised around. Mm-hmm. Um, but women were much more um, 
guarded about how they discussed sexuality, uh, certainly in masturbation. And a sex ritual really I mean, masturbation is a core part of that mm -hmm. ritual. And so I think if you were raised in a place where it's a shameful thing or it's an embarrassing thing or it's just a you don't talk about it type of thing, well, then it would be difficult to discuss a sex ritual within that context. Um, but also, I'm, I'm sure there's ways of performing sex rituals without actually masturbating. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, certainly with the way that uh, Citizen Phantasma explained in his, I, I doubt, you know, well, I don't know, maybe he did, but you know, it just never really came up because it wasn't about him. It was about uh, a connection between him and his uh, partner. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a, a really fantastic way of approaching it. And it's, it's just an interesting discussion. Um, I think of all three t specific types of rituals, if you buckle down and, and are practicing just one without bleeding another into it, mm -hmm. then maybe sex ritual is the least practiced, I would mm. think. Yeah, and to me it seems sort of like, if we're talking about t like typical gender roles, let's pretend we are, um, especially in a lust ritual, I feel like women are more likely to, just more likely to use lesser magic when it comes to lust and attraction, where yeah. it feels like greater magic is more a manly pursuit in, as far as lust. Like, they want to take control of the situation, where women traditionally, you know, sort of take on that coy, like, flirty manipulative way to get to get what they want where men you know it's sort of like i am going to take what i want did you you know like yeah. there's this there's a theatricality like inherent in men's desire for women you know we're, we're, it's all about theater for men it's mm -hmm. all about like putting on an act and pretending you're you know somebody you're not where women it's a little more subtle <laughs> we're all liars <laughs> oh my god of course <laughs> oh yeah well we have another contributor heather height uh you have to hear this let's talk about it afterward this is heather height and i have two stories as adam asked for our successes and failures at greater magic the first one comes from before i actually knew that i was a satanist it was a situation where i um was broken up with by a guy who i supported for four years like nothing is more infuriating than feeling like you're a character in a stupid rom-com. I was livid, to say the least, and on top of that, he insisted that he, you know, the wanna be friends thing, but it, for him, this was telling me details about all of his new love interests, which was so stupid on his part because he didn't get laid for like a year after we broke up. But um, that's all the lesser magic, mostly. The way that greater magic came into play was he had a love interest at his new job. She was married, but had decided to leave her husband. And it was like one of those situations where she was really leaving her husband for my ex-boyfriend, since he's the kind of guy who would be like, I don't want to be responsible for your marriage breaking up. Don't do that. She was acting like she was going to leave her husband anyway. So he basically was breaking up a marriage. So what I did was I did a lust ritual, which at the time I did not call it a lust ritual. I called it a love spell on this girl and her husband. And I emoted and and put all of myself into this, like put myself in a space where I really cared about these two people and and like love them and the idea of them and just their hunger sexually for each other and their love for each other. And it didn't keep them together forever, but it did definitely have an impact on the length of time it took her to leave her husband and consequently interfered with my ex-boyfriend's plans or his pretending he didn't have plans to break up this marriage. The, so that was a success. The um, failure in that is that no matter how much I put myself in that space in the ritual, I had no love for this girl. <laughs> so, um, so that was, it was sort of a failure in that sense. And it was also a failure in the sense that I didn't bother to get rid of any of my anger like I clearly st still to this day am just furious with this guy just hate him if he decided to take his own life like right now that would make me happy yeah clearly I still have a thing <laughs> that uh, maybe I should have uh, should have done something about getting rid of that anger and not carrying that around 
I was hell bent on making his life miserable, and he's he's such a sex addict that he actually like lost a job be- previous to us meeting each other because he got caught with a prostitute, and uh, he's a, a counselor for kids, so that didn't go over well at work. The really funny part about that story is that he wasn't caught with a prostitute, trying to pick up a prostitute. And the under, undercover cop that he was trying to pick up, his sister was like best friends with her, and his sister actually helped her get ready that night, like not knowing that her brother was going to try to pick her up, but so the cop that busted him was best friends with His life is a shitstorm. Why did I date that guy? Anyway, the... Um, Post realizing that I'm a Satanist, I uh, actually had like what I would consider to be a failure at Greater Magic. And it was a um, ritual that my husband David and I did together to um, bring down some competition business wise. And it didn't pan out the way we wanted to. I think we tend to uh, get in our own way. I don't think that we put enough into it the business is still in business and we're not in business so maybe like we didn't have you know our emotions into it the way we should have in the ritual we were we were pretty on point but i just don't think in our lives our energies were directed enough for that to pan out so maybe caused some little ripples but nothing to the extent that we had hoped it would be Those are my stories. Happy Halloween and hail Satan. Okay, Aaron. So we heard Heather's uh, two stories, uh, really interesting takes on a lust ritual, I think. And I kind of want to touch on the destruction one uh, briefly, though we are going to dive really heavily into destruction later. Uh, Seemingly, a lot of people like to destroy other people. (laughs) Shocking. Yeah. So let's talk about this lust ritual. She, She performed a lust ritual in order to keep two people whom she wasn't really invested in together solely so this ex of hers couldn't get in on it. What what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I guess the the reason it failed, and I I suppose Heather would would say this, I don't know, um, but it was the the, the end result wasn't actually what the ritual was about. Does it make sense? And maybe, I I mean, I hate to uh, explain her story away um, because that's for her to do. We're just examining it, yeah. Yeah, but it seems like that, like the end result was actually her, should have been a sort of destruction ritual against her ex-boyfriend, because really ultimately what she wanted was for him to fail Mm -hmm. at his goal. Well, I would like to double down on uh, a line that was delivered a little earlier, and it says, um, formulas are to be adhered to, as applying the wrong type of ritual toward a desired result can lead to trouble of a complicated nature. So when Anton LaVey wrote that, you know, this could be a really wonderful explanation for that. She was conducting a lust ritual in order to punish, ultimately, same from our perspective, her ex-boyfriend. So she applied the wrong type of ritual and didn't get the result because of that. Um, I think that would be an interesting reaction, though. Again, this is just our interpretation of the story. Mm. Um, and I would also like to sort of touch on her destruction ritual that um, failed uh, in her own words, because they really weren't 100% into it. (laughs) As far as rituals are concerned, I mean, would you say you have to be fully in in order to even bother with them? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. (laughs) And I think that's part of the reason why I, I, you know, I've said, like I mentioned before, I don't get into it that much because I have a hard time fully committing to anything. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, I think you have, that's the whole point is that you have to really really believe this and and anything short of that is a waste of your time really yeah and so the other side of that is whether you're fully into it or not the the sole purpose of ritual is to purge emotions that are or thoughts that are mm-hmm. hindering you from your life yeah. uh, it's the psychodrama side of the greater magic ritual so if you are concerned with the outcome after you have left the ritual chamber, was it? could you even consider it a successful ritual? Regardless no. of the outcome, but if you're concerned about it, yeah. could you even see it as a success? I wouldn't think so. You know, the whole point is to completely exercise these 
these demons, right? Mm -hmm. Or what, depending on the ritual that you're performing, but it's to sort of, yes, get them over with, get it out of your system so that you can move on with your life. And that's the whole goddamn point. So if you are like nitpicking and second guessing and wondering, and then it was, you know, a failure. I, I mean, maybe a complete failure, but at least a failure to some degree. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to extend a hearty thank you to Heather for that. She didn't have to give me any failures of a story, but I'm really grateful that she did just so that we can discuss it in this way. Um, she, she, I mean, she's a very, uh, powerful witch in her own right mm-hmm. and you know she could have just gave as a lot of the listeners did and some of the other contributors just a number of successes but uh it's the ability to show a little vulner a little vulnerability for the sake of the discussion which i think is uh, a really really wonderful contribution so thank you heather for that Love let's her. move to compassion rituals with the anger of anguish and the wrath of the stifled, I pour forth my voices, wrapped in rolling thunder that you may hear. O oh, great lurkers in the darkness, O oh, guardians of the way, O oh, minions of the might of Thoth, move and appear, present yourselves to us in your benign power, in behalf of one who believes and is stricken with torment. A word of warning concerning compassion. Be resolved that you'll have no regrets at the expense of the help you have given others, should their newfound blessings place an obstacle in your path. Be grateful for things that come to you through the use of magic. Compassion ritual. Uh, it, Aaron, do you think this is the most common of rituals, or do you think destruction is most common? I, I would put my money on destruction. <laughs> <laughs> But I, yes, I would almost guess that, well, it's hard to say, but I think, yeah, compassion is one of the, um, well, there's sort of two aspects of compassion. That's one mm-hmm. to- directed toward other people and then those directed toward yourself. So in that sense, um, you know, it's, it's used twice as much maybe as, as, as sex or lust, but in this, um, under the same heading. Yeah. But I don't know, it's, do you prefer, do you do more, do you do compassion rituals? And if you do, like, is it more directed at yourself or others? So I have conducted compassion rituals and uh, it is by far the most common. I thing is, I don't ritualize a lot, to be quite honest. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't find a lot of need for it traditionally in my life. But when I am compelled, it is almost always compassion and it is almost always for those that I love. Uh, very, very rarely do I do it for myself because I utilize lesser magic on a day-to-day basis, which gets mm-hmm. me pretty much what I need. So I don't, I don't really feel a need for the compassion side of it for myself. Um, but I think it is an important idea to understand and to uh, explore for people if you haven't before. Uh, I think it's a, really challenging for a lot of people, and, and let me know if you feel the same way or not in order to categorize rituals you know we we see something and and i want to sort of double back on heather's uh, for example she saw this situation and she felt like she had to put a specific type of a ritual in place um and a lot of the situations we find ourselves in life that inspire the need for ritual could be in a lot of these or a combination of these types of ritual, whether it's compassion destruction or sex destruction or or compassion sex, you know, or performing one type of a ritual, and we'll talk about this here in a second, um, having a multiple end, whether it's compassion and destruction or or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think it's difficult to, to, to really find this specific type of a ritual for a lot of the complex situations in life that would require ritualing? Ritualizing? Um, yeah, you know, it probably is, but I think you it, owe it to yourself to, to really get to the bottom of it. You know, I don't think it's something that you want to mess around with, as we've talked about. I think it's something it's worth putting the time in to figure out exactly what you really, truly want from the situation. And, and if it turns out that you start one ritual thinking that um, I think Jesse talked about this. I f- this sounds like something Jesse would say. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's it reminds me, but I think it was her. But saying, you know, you, you start out thinking that you want to perform a ritual so that you can get rich. But really, mm. what what you 
it, you don't, the money is not the end. It is a means to an end. You know, it's, you want to see your child go to Juilliard because they have a specific t- t- musical talent. I think that was yeah. her example. But yeah, so I think it, you, it behooves you to figure out exactly what the actual ends is rather than, you know, ritualizing about something that's just a means to an act, the actual ends. And, you know, sometimes you start think planning one ritual and then figure out, oh no, what this is not what I want to perform. I should be performing a destruction ritual or, you know, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And that was, yeah, she she did have a, an episode of her yeah. um, I Dream of Jesse segment, which Thank was you, yeah, really yeah. fantastic, <laughs> that, that spoke directly to that, um, finding the real cause uh, behind or the real result that you're looking for and, and not the the first phase of that result. Yeah, um, it's it is important. And we have a number of listeners that uh, tuned in and contributed to this specific type of ritual. So let's go to a listener here and see what they have to say about it. My greater magic work draws a lot on my German and Scandinavian roots. I do most of my ritual work outside at an old tree stump that I've turned into an altar. When I call upon the gods or the land vet or the land spirits, I'm doing so from a point of view of equals. A big idea in most heathen traditions is that the gods and the landvetter are not worshipped, but shown respect. Something that drew me to Satanism was this study part. A lot of followers of Osetru and heathenry feel the same way, calling it a, quote, religion of homework. This is the belief I came from last, and that I draw heavily upon. That said... There was a time when we were in a tight place financially, and I just felt I needed ideas for making more money in a shorter amount of time. For me, greater magic puts me in the right headspace. This time, it did a little more. I started the ritual at 3 a.m., which is my normal time for doing so. I I picked that time because for myself, being awake at 3 a.m. takes more effort and focus. Uh, it usually a waking up early sort of thing, like, and, and putting my energy at the beginning of the day. For this ritual, I pour two smallish glasses of mead, about six ounces each, that I make myself. Um, on a side note, when I make the mead for drinking, I also make it uh, a smaller extra side batch for ritual purpose, the set apart uh portion of it, it really, it feels like I'm putting energy and effort into it for this reason. Really, I feel that it adds to uh, the overall effect. For this, I take my first glass, I pour it into a drinking horn. I say words that I, for this reason, I keep personal to myself. Um, I then pour this, the mead from the horn, onto the altar. I then take the second glass, say some different words. And, uh, and then I drink the mead myself, followed by silence. After this ritual, it was a week or so later, um, we received a small settlement check that I didn't know was, was coming. Now, when I look back and I, I see that, you know, it makes sense that we received it. And it wasn't life-changing money, but it was just what we needed at the time. Also, my wife was offered a job out of the blue that she didn't apply for. Somebody needed a job done and she could do it and from home so she could take care of our kids without, without putting them in daycare. Now, these results are not what typically happens for us. So in that I'm not advocating that greater magic is a way to get free money. In fact, that most cases, this does not happen to us in this way at all. So while I don't believe in the gods and the spirits. I have done rituals and I have gotten results. That said, the biggest thing for me where rituals are involved, where greater magic rituals are involved is that it reaffirms in my mind that I'm doing everything possible to succeed. Not to be mistaken with laziness, for greater magic is not a form of satanic welfare. I work my ass off. I am even back in school to complete some extra education to further my career. Greater magic does work, 
but you have to first, for me, put in the legwork. You have to put yourself in the place to receive the callback, to make the money, and in some cases, get the girl. And that is greater magic for me. Hail Satan. So that was a really uh, amazing uh, story from the listener. I, I want to double down, um, I'm sorry, double back and, and talk a little bit about those two ideas that he, he put forth in there. And that is, satanic ritual doesn't always have to follow the satanic Bible format. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think it's okay to uh, completely shake loose even the satanic format and just use whatever works for you? Yeah, totally. I'm all for it. I think, um, you know, it's sort of like once you know the rules, then you can break them. It's that sort of thing. Like, yes, if you are well versed in rituals, you've been doing them for years and years and you understand what they're, you know, what, what we're really trying to do here and what we're getting down to. And then 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 you have free reign to sort of um, put your own spin on them and change them completely, you know, start with mm -hmm. the bare skeleton and build your own or, you know, if people do that, people make their own rituals are still being made. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a great use of your talents. If you're, if you're able to do that. And I mean, really the, the sole idea of ritual is, and, and just being a Satanist is being an individual. Mm -hmm. If, if something is not working for you, or if you just feel more connected through mm -hmm. another religion's, uh, ritual, uh, trappings. Well, if it if it works for you, use it. Whatever you need to do in order to reach that ultimate goal that pulled you into the chamber, uh, do so. Really, it's about you. It's not about how other people see you or how other people see you ritualize. It doesn't matter. I, I don't know about you, but I've never uh, recorded a ritual in order to show someone, say, hey, check out what I did. <laughs> no. That's it's, a weird it's, thing to do. It's all about you. I, um, I can't remember where I read it, but yeah, magic, greater or lesser, works because of you. And if, you know, it's most effective when you have completely digested it and you understand it and you're able to then, you, you know, it changes because of you. It just be, because you have fully ingested it. It is now something completely different that you can transform, come, you know, it comes out of you. But it's all about you. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the second point that he made um, uh, in his story, and that is greater magic is not satanic welfare. You know, it's easy to look at, especially if you're seeing results from your greater magic, uh, to see it as an easy way to get things. Like, ooh, I, I got this money that came in just in the nick of time. Do you think people should rely on that as Satanists? Well, no, I think um, that's for other <laughs> religions to indulge in. That's sort of like... <laughs> yeah. um, on demand, you know, like, yeah. um, sort of help, you know, you have to put the work in, that's what it's all about. And if, you know, if you're putting the work, if you're ritualizing every single day for something, well, you're putting the work in, you know, How, who's to say then what, what you deserve and what you don't, except for you, you know, if you're putting in the work and you're seeing the results, um, then it's not charity. It's not welfare. You're making it happen for yourself. But yeah, to, to sort of come back to it like as um going back to the well and you sort of drain the um significance of it mm -hmm. i think it's uh, it's an interesting idea that um we you know if you think of greater magic as a means to an end solely the use of greater magic as a means to an end then i think you're shortcutting uh the way you should be approaching life. Um, there is no magic bullet. There is no saving grace. There is no one trick that is going to fix everything for you. Um, when I think of what would drive me to perform a ritual, greater ma uh, the ritual itself is only a part of that. Greater magic is only a part of that uh, experiment in, in life. You have to move through life and move forward as if the ritual was a success and that act itself leads again to the success of the ritual you have to use lesser magic in conjunction with greater magic in order to truly realize success in my opinion mm -hmm. you you can't just hope it worked and cross your fingers and close your eyes really really tight it's not going to do shit for you you have to then follow it up with real world action. And I, I want to double down on this point and make sure I'm absolutely clear because I think it is really, really important. Mm 
Satanism is about living your life. It is not about hoping for things or striving for things. Certainly you have goals and you achieve them, but that's real world experience. We are not about sitting in our basement and ritualizing hoping money is going to come to us so we can continue sitting in our basement. We need to get out and experience life. That is Satanism. And using greater magic to enhance our lives is important, but refusing to live our life while practicing greater magic in the hopes that it will give us a life is not satanic. Understand the difference. I think it's really important. I spoke with Milton Kruver. You all know him, friend of the show. Mm. Let's see what he has to say. Let's see about his story. This particular experience was in a group ritual that I'd partaken in. And we, of course, talked about it beforehand. We did all of our workings, uh, you know, writing, writing of, our, of our desires and our manifestations on parchment beforehand. We talked about them. You know, we got all the intellectualism out of it uh, beforehand. And we, we went through the motions and we looked at everything in the ritual chamber. We, of course, set everything up and we did placements. That way it was all done beforehand. So when we entered with only a few candles blazing... It was all very somber. It was all very, very quiet, even though we were in a uh, <laughs> in an urban setting and it just felt it just felt right. Um, there was a there was a calm, just kind of like a a, a passive uh, pall to the to the air. And we all took our places and the ritual began with the gong. And as the ritual grew and, you know, the incantations were spoken and the names were called forth. Um, I've, I've experienced these group rituals with this particular coterie uh, a few times and it's always every single time I've been brought to tears, uh, just from the pure power that's been manifested uh, by my own energy as well as those involved. So when we were, when we were approaching the, the altar and we burned our, our desires, uh, this th these particular rituals kind of culminated each of the the compassion rituals and the destruction rituals and the lust rituals. It was all kind of um, I won't say an amalgamation, but it was a, a beautiful fusion of each basic ritual. And then of course we had our own our own particular uh, demons and gods that we that we called upon for our own personalities. And it was it was really beautiful the the way that it was it was done there's really nothing like <laughs> quite like group group ritual and as it progressed the the air was was <laughs> it's just kind of odd to to describe hmm. it became heavier it became um palpable um almost like being mired in in you know something like a, a deep mist um even though it was near 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 pitch black in the room and we completed our ritual and there was that just, <laughs> any good any good manifestation any good working i've always had is that you're exhausted afterwards there's this it's like uh, it's like having a wonderful orgasm even if you don't do a lust ritual which we didn't uh, mm. specifically but we we sat down and uh, we just kind of looked at each other and, you know, smiling. And, and the, once we'd recovered, you know, we hugged and we and we and we, uh, we talked about it. But there was that sense of, you know, finality of wonderful. So it is done. And it it, it truly was uh, kind of a we we took bits and pieces from each of the main each of the main rituals, uh, but it, it really lent something special to it. And there there really is nothing quite like group ritual i mean mm -hmm. magic exists it works you know you use it or you lose it so do you mind if i ask um if you if you're comfortable mm -hmm. what were um you know maybe, maybe vaguely uh what was the outcome that you were looking for and did that manifest oh my goodness um <laughs> we we hear all the time in our world about you know about miracles and about coincidence and the things that I asked for were incredibly uh, specific. You know, I'm a family man, and <laughs> I was—I uh, can—I can speak personally. 
I was worried about, you know, moving before the holidays. I've just moved now. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got two small kids. You know, there's, it's 1,500 miles or thereabouts uh, between San Diego and, and Washington where we live now. Um, you know, I didn't have a job in the works. Everything was happening so fast. How am I going to do all this? So, of course, I was very anxious. I had all these things just kind of welled up inside of me, and they were affecting other aspects of my life. Um, but I had uh, friends that I didn't think uh, would be able to uh, physically and time schedule wise help me. They suddenly became available uh, the next day. Uh, my father was able to come down and actually drive the 26 foot moving truck with the trailer on the back, hmm. which took a huge weight off off of me. Um, you know, money was an issue. I, I wasn't going to be getting separation pay for my job. Um, nor the option of unemployment insurance because I was going to be quitting, right? And then, <laughs> you know, boom, the next week, this is actually terrible, uh, my department upends in, at work and it's going to be moving to Atlanta. So, <laughs> so the rest of the department gets basically laid off or will be laid off in the next few months. Um, but I get a generous severance package now. I get unemployment insurance. Nice. It's, yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, you know, t- you know, and this was two days before I was going to give my notice. I was going to give my notice on a Friday for, for my two weeks notice. And on that Wednesday of that week, which is the week after we did our ritual, they pulled the department together and say, hey, sorry, uh, your jobs are moving to Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm so glad I didn't give you my two weeks notice. Um, th- that worked perfectly. So now I was able to use the company's benefits uh, for my benefit. Um, I mean, on top of this, not only did I get, uh, I was able to finagle and it just kind of worked out that, you know, a 26 foot U-Haul is $4,600 usually, but I got it for 2,500. The small moving trailer that we got was $1,700 and I ended up getting it for 10 because we ended up getting a two day. I mean, just things just fell into place. Everything that I'd been worrying about was just taken care of. Um, even our new home. Um, we, we, we were able to get a lease on a wonderful house that instead of a crappy little apartment, which is what we were going to have to do that fell, that was the next week. Um, even some of the issues in the house, you know, pl- place things having to be replaced. They're all going to be pr- pr- replaced for free and it, it's going to be better than it was even if we had moved in and everything had been fine. Um, <laughs> the day, the, the Monday after, uh, the ritual, I was contacted by an amazing company for two job prospects. And then, uh, so, so I have two interviews lined up and then I have two other prospective companies that I'm working with, um, to see if, if there's, there's jobs, uh, there are jobs that I'm going to be m- hopefully moving into. So there's, there's so many opportunities that have come into it. I was worried about my children getting along with their cousins. Um, but they're getting along great. They've been playing with them. It's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, the, the small neighborhood that we're in has, I've met all the neighbors. Everyone's fine, upstanding citizens, it seems, unless they're, you know, serial killers, which you never know. Deviants. <laughs> right. Um, even have a couple, it, it, there's a, there's a few couples with children, um, around my, my brood's own age. The crime rate is incredibly low. The schools in the districts are, I mean, everything, everything that I had been worried about that I had written down and desired and just made manifest and given all of my energy and all of my will and and called upon just fit um i mean even even things about my own show i was you know in the middle of moving you know how it is Mm -hmm. uh getting things going with my own show and having you know keeping up with you know producing your show and i had an interview going on and other endeavors i didn't think i was gonna have to you know be able to finish them but these were things that i had to get done before i left san diego and they happened they, they were able to fit nicely into the, the scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> needless to say, everything truly did fall into place most yeah, beautifully. It's, it's an result. amazing thing um, for, for those of us who, who do practice greater magic in that, <clears throat> you know, it, it could be that uh, the psychodrama itself uh, – clarified your focus or it could be that your will uh, manifested and uh, made changes that otherwise wouldn't have been made Mm -hmm. but either way it doesn't matter exactly what you wanted to happen happened and that is what is so fantastic about it is you know you have a lot of people who uh detractors to greater magic and i think the majority of them they want specific well why is it working or how is it working it doesn't matter like don't focus on that that's not the important part mm-hmm. 
The important part is your will be done and recognizing it when it does. So congratulations to you. That's amazing. Um, do you mind if I ask you a, a quick follow-up question about group ritual? Please, of course. So I've only been involved in one group ritual. Well, that's not true. I've been involved in two group rituals. Um, one had uh, an immense amount of um, logistical planning beforehand, and the other, not so much. Uh, do you think it's important to to get your ducks in a row, so to speak, for ritual before you enter the chamber? Or do you think it really matters? If, if everyone's in the same page, could you just uh, be as productive uh, without the planning and jumping right in? I think it definitely depends upon the experience of the of the practitioners. There's um, there's definitely something to be said for adding your own flair to it. That's why I really enjoy having personalized segments almost in a ritual where each person, if they're comfortable, can come up and be a part of the ritual and call upon their own entities, their own personalities. Um, for some groups, I think absolutely you should make sure that you have your ducks in a row if it's a very formalized, a very stylized ritual. Um, but actually, and I've heard this before from other people, the best parts of a ritual are when somebody fucks up and <laughs> it works. I, I did it. The, actually, the very last group ritual that we did, it was kind of a farewell going away ritual. Um, <laughs> I fucked up and <laughs> instead of letting the the leader of the ritual burn the the offering so to speak i burnt them midway because i was the middle man going up and burning them and it worked perfectly because it was the midway of you know everybody before me had put theirs into the urn and then i i said my little piece which was totally not part of the plan and then i set my my parchment on fire threw it into the urn everyone else's little blaze and then everyone else after me uh did, came up, said their piece, and then threw theirs into the already burning. It worked beautifully. Things like that. And yeah. and there was – it's palpable when that happens because you think it's like an, oh, crap, I messed up. But it lends that personal weighty experience to it, that hu you know, that humanism to it. Um, and, and, and it's beautiful. It really does depend upon the group. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I would actually – if you have a regular group that you do uh, – that you do ritual with, have fun. You know, try and ad lib some. It's it's gonna be funny, but mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to have a great sense of humor. Otherwise, why the hell are you doing it? Well, thank you so much, Milton. I really appreciate you uh, being able to share your personal experiences and the outcomes. Uh, again, I think it's really important that we recognize the success of our workings, and uh, yours is spot on. Congratulations. Always, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. So this is interesting. So this is the first um, that, well, I mean, Heather's was group ritual with her husband, but uh, this is the first one that was a mass group ritual um, story that, that was shared. Um, Milton was very forthcoming with it, which I thought was really wonderful. H how do you see group ritual? Is it something that everyone has to be in the same mindset or can they be in their own zones? I mean, what, do no. you, what do you think? You gotta all be fully invested on the exact same thing. You can't have that's what this is all about. And I know I'm stressing it like crazy, but you it's you have to take it very seriously. And everyone in the room has to be involved. And I think I um I believe it was Magus Gilmore who said at some point that um, this isn't theater. Uh, mm -hmm. It's ritual. You know, it's not about an audience. Uh, you know, up um, you know, like an actor in an audience. It's about um, participants so everyone has to be participating and they all have to be working toward the same ends you know it's not pageantry it's not or not simply pageantry especially with um, group rituals there is pageantry involved and that's kind of the exciting part um, mm -hmm. but yes if if if, if somebody's going to be there they better they sure as fuck better be on the same page as you because <laughs> otherwise they're going to take you out of it one way or another. It's going to ruin the ritual if someone is, you know, if, if I <laughs> and it would be me if I were there, I'd be the <laughs> one, you know, giggling at the mispronounced words or something, you know. So, yeah, get rid of that person. They're detritus. <laughs> they're, get the fuck out of here, Aaron. That's all you have to say. Yeah. Well, we do have a lot of other listeners that yeah. shared their stories. So let's hear another one now. Hi, Adam, and whoever else might hear this. I thought I'd share a story for your Greater Magic episode. I had a friend a few years ago who was falling into a deep depression. Uh, his wife had divorced him, 
took his baby daughter away and left him struggling financially. He was behind on his rent. His landlord was threatening eviction. He had to borrow money from his parents to buy food because his bills and child support were taking his whole paycheck. And to top it off, he was lonely for a female companion. After hearing from his parents that they were worried he might go so far as to take his own life, I decided I would do what I could on my friend's behalf to prevent such a tragedy. Knowing he would welcome any help he could receive, I asked if he would like to join me during my planned ritual. After all, if nothing else, it would be an opportunity to vent his frustration. He jumped at the chance. We asked a co-worker if we could have a private bonfire in a clearing on his heavily forested land. We were granted permission, so we gathered all of our ritual trappings and headed to the spot. And that night, we pretty much stuck to the standard compassion ritual in the Satanic Bible. And I was leading it. Uh, in short, we asked for all of the joys and necessities that he had been missing in his life to be returned. After the ritual was closed, we headed home. I didn't hear from him the next day. At all. But on the second day after the ritual, he called and told me what he'd been up to the day before. While visiting a friend from his workplace, he had met a woman. She'd moved here from out of state only a month before and had been bouncing around from one family member's house to another. My friend was immediately attracted to her and she apparently was to him. And so he asked if she'd like to become his roommate. She accepted and moved into his house that night and as you probably imagine, they quickly graduated from roommates to lovers. The very next day, she bought a kitchen full of groceries, paid up the rent that he was behind on, and even redecorated his apartment. And within two weeks, they were married. And I wish I could tell you that their marriage had stood the test of time, but they divorced within six months. Still, the ritual seemed to have had an immediate effect, giving him exactly what he needed to climb out of the abyss he had been trapped in for some time. Thanks for the opportunity to share my story. Lanny. Hi, Adam. Calling in over here from California. This is Quentin. Wanted to drop by and give my, uh, my greater magic success story. I recently have been having some severe problems with my superior at work. Um, to the point where it's causing problems in my home life as well. So I decided to perform not only um, a compassion ritual for myself, but also a destruction ritual for my supervisor. And personalizing my ceremony was more along the lines of letting myself feel extremely comfortable with what I was feeling and with what I wanted to come from the ritual. I included many visual images of things that I aspired to or things that I have overcome in symbolically to symbolize, <laughs> um, I guess, all the hurdles that I have overcome and that I can't overcome. And the results of my rituals, um, about a week ago, my supervisor was arrested and put in prison for his third DUI charge. And I now comfortably lay on his throne as now supervisor over the plant. <laughs> That's incredible, man. Um, well, let me ask you, because there are distinct differences in the standard Bible uh, between the compassion and the destruction. And y you sort of need to take your mind in different directions in order to really fully realize each of those. What was that like for you combining them? Um, was it challenging at all? Um, you know, I thought it was going to be more challenging than it actually was. I actually planned on doing two separate rituals for each. However, I found 
when I thought about performing a compassion ritual for myself, it also involved a lot of negative feelings towards my enemies. So it became kind of easy to really combine the, the love I feel for myself and the things I wish to accomplish. It was really easy to meld that with, I guess, the, the my need for the destruction of my enemies. So I kind of morphed it to be one and the same for me. I got the emotional pull from both sides during the ceremony, so I wasn't lacking emotionally at all. It was... I have to say it was quite an experience. It was it was something else having to personalize two rituals into one, definitely. Yeah. Um one thing that uh I don't know, it's if it's personal experience or or just uh how we as magicians manipulate the ritual, but you know, when we think of these isolated rituals, uh, whether it's compassion or lust or destruction, uh, they all in some way lead to y yourself feeling better. So y you could say that the side effect of all of them uh, is a form of compassion in of itself. Um, it, it's strange when you go into it expecting it to be a mix when the chances are, of course... The result is going to be that you always feel better about yourself because you've purged whatever hang-ups emotionally you've had. So I know a lot of Satanists have, uh, as here's, here's something I, I said to a couple of friends the other day, there are as many third side perspectives as there are Satanists, meaning oh, we yes. all have our own interpretations of things. Um, when, uh, when you think of ritual, if you're comfortable saying, do you think of it as a um, simply a, a formal way of purging yourself of emotions or do you think of it uh, as a, you know a psychodrama for example or do you think of it in terms of actually manipulating the world around you um, it's and I ask let me preface this a little bit before you answer because we have so many different perspectives about uh, one, if greater magic is a thing, and then two, if it is a thing, then whether or not it's for you or if it's to affect the world around you, and depending on who is speaking, it's a completely different uh, take. Uh, so as a Satanist yourself, what do you think? Well, speaking for myself personally, um, I believe that Ritual can be the most pure source of release of whatever emotion you feel the need to release at the time. And for most people, I don't know, maybe half of the people out there, that's, that's all they get from the ritual is, okay, I purged my emotions, I now have a clear mindset, and I can set forth to accomplish my goals. Mm. But I feel like there are some of us out there, and I am one of them, I must say, who, you know, I mean, you do these things, you perform these rituals, and you feel great about yourself, and then you, sl personally, you slowly start, things start to unfold, and it, I don't know if you can really explain things like that. I do, I do personally think that there may be something to it. I don't believe that it is some, you know, red horned suave guy downstairs <laughs> with a pitchfork yeah, yeah. going, yeah, yeah, here you go. Here's all the things that you want. But yeah. I definitely think there is something to it. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, I've, I loved your episode on the super normal that you guys did not too long ago. Yes. Last year. That was last year's great magic episode. Absolutely. Oh, was it? Wow. That long ago already. Wow. Um, that was fantastic. And I, if you experience super normal things often enough, it kind of becomes hard to deny the fact that there are super normal things. Mm -hmm. And myself, I've experienced a lot of super normal attributes kind of throughout the course of my life. And it, but prior to my claiming as a Satanist, uh, very much like you, I was very deep into the occult, and I was like, ooh, yay, there's got to be something to it. It's got to be so extraordinary. But 
doing things that way, you don't really feel the same thing that you feel doing a satanic ritual. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is, but I feel if you can put off enough energy in the right direction that you want to go, I feel like that energy can also work for you instead of you working solo by yourself, provided you can summon enough energy. Yeah. It is interesting because, you know, when we're describing it, because I, I describe it much in the same way that you do, um, our logical sides of our brains want to equate, you know, one cup of this equals one cup of that. But the reality is it, nothing in life is really like that. So, oh, you know, you, you mentioned um, you put off enough energy. You know, we there are so many aspects of reality that that are still sort of up in the air, not fully realized. Um, and that's the, the majesty of science and discovery. But when it comes uh, into play, uh, for example, like greater magic, we don't really need to understand it fully. We know that, uh, you know, in your specific example, results happened after you conducted your ritual, and that's enough. Um, <laughs> I always, I, I remember because, you know, you'd already mentioned that um, I was into the occult as you were, um, there's always that idea of this sort of like rule, like there is some sort of cosmic uh, justified uh, behavioral device out there that if you do this, then something must happen to you to sort of like there's a, like some sort of balance in the universe, which is, in my opinion, this absurd notion. The oh, reality is, is there, <laughs> there's energy and then there's manipulation and direction of energy, and that's literally all there is to it. There's no right or wrong. There's no morals in a supernova. It, it just it happens. And so if, if we imagine our greater magic expression as its own version of a supernova, then we just unleash the energy out there, and our will will be done. And it's it's... It's really hard to explain for people who have never experienced it or never even tried it. And yet, I personally find, I don't know about you, those who uh, refute the idea of greater magic traditionally have never really given it a shot. Um, but for those who have and they've seen results, it, it's you mentioned it earlier, it's hard to argue it. You know, it, I mean, there's only so really much is. coincidence comes into play. It really is. It really is kind of hard to argue things that you've experienced yourself. And in my opinion, in regards to the Satanists out there who do not feel greater magic should be a part of their life, whether a small or large portion of their life, I feel like if you're going to call yourself a Satanist, you have to be able to almost, it's almost suspension of disbelief. Like when it comes to film or cinema, you almost need to give it just a little bit of slack. That way, when you tug on the rope, you really absorb all the information that it has to offer. And it, you really get to explore all the fun little things in the Satanic Bible and in the Satanic rituals that make Satanism appealing to other people. I mean, it's not... I don't mean strictly the greater magic portion or strictly lesser magic or Satanism's philosophy. But I feel like you almost have to have a sense of humor enough to be able to jump into it, not go in expecting anything from yourself. And if it clicks with you, it clicks with you. Perfect. If it doesn't, Hey, you gave it a shot and it didn't work for you. So you move on, you continue with your lesser magic and your other skills and you get where you want to be without greater magic. But I do believe everyone should attempt it at least once. It is a great emotional purge, if nothing else. Yeah. It, and it's hard to argue. And this is, Again, this is my opinion. This is not the position of the Church of Satan as an organization. But um, half of the Satanic Bible is ritual. Half of it. Definitely. The sole follow-up to the Satanic Bible is Satanic Rituals. So 
it is a big part of of what it means to be a Satanist, um, in my opinion. Uh, oh so, no, it definitely is. It's it's getting your dinner and only eating the steak, but not eating yeah, anything yeah. else. You're missing it. But I do like. I mean, you mentioned you know it's it's it, part of the fun. You know, as, as Satanists, the more Satanists I meet that I come across either in social media or in in person, the more I'm a little bit concerned that collectively we are falling into these tropes of taking ourselves far too seriously, that we're not actually enjoying life. And the point, as I'm interpreting Satanism, is uh, to enjoy what you're doing. This is our only shot. Let's ha- let, let's command those around us. Let's command the environment. But let's have fun doing it. Yes. It's about theater. It's about excitement. It's about drama. It's about ritual. Let's 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 recognize who and what we are, and let's have fun in the process. Because when it's done, man, it's done. You don't get no second shot. Exactly. Ritual yeah. is celebration for me. If you're a Satanist and you're not celebrating life, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> you need you need to be able to poke fun at yourself, poke fun at other things, not take life so seriously, although yes, take portions of life extremely seriously if it's a serious matter, but right, right. Just have fun. You're here once. It's I mean, come on. It's all in the same it's the satanic bible. It's mm-hmm. all about indulgence. So indulge and have fun while you're indulging. Fantastic. Thank you so much, man. I really do appreciate uh, all of that. Of course. Thank you, Adam, for having me. Well, Quentin, until we can chat again, hail Satan. Hail Satan. So that was a really interesting conversation. I I didn't really take into account the idea before uh, he and I spoke of combining rituals. I mean, in a group setting, I've conducted rituals where there were multiple types together, but I'd never done it like within just me, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, do you think uh, that that that's uh, good, bad? What, I mean, how does that work for you? It seems like it works great for Quentin. I think it worked yeah. out well. I think it's genius. You know, anything that works for you, it, I you know, it's, it's, it's it is a success. Uh, I think it's brilliant. It's a great use of time. I'm all about efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is interesting because. You know, you can come into the idea of satanic magic, especially when there's something like uh, the satanic Bible that outlines specific steps, uh, five steps of success, uh, you know, different performance techniques. I mean, it really outlines everything for you. And if you're an analytical type person, breaking from that may be a problem for you. You know, It may not work for you, um, but it's not, I think it is, Interesting, we've spoken to it in the past in different uh, Greater Magic episodes, but it is something that, you know, if you want to customize it, if you want to change it up, really no problem with that. Whatever you need to do to see your end fully realized. And just because in a group ritual, it may make sense, like, for example, the uh, 6606 uh, Satanic Ritual uh, in California, that was all the rituals combined together one after another in this sort of formal uh, presentation. You can do that within your own self too. You don't have to have a group. You don't have to have other people helping you. And uh, he did it brilliantly with uh, just the desired outcome. So how about, Aaron, we continue to the darkest side of satanic ritual. Let's do it. Behold, the mighty voices of my vengeance smash the stillness of the air and stand as monoliths of wrath upon a plain of withering serpents. I am become as a monstrous machine of annihilation to the festering fragments of the body of he or she who would detain me. A word of warning concerning destruction. Be certain you do not care if the intended victim lives or dies before you throw your curse. And having caused their destruction, revel rather than remorse. Hello, I'm a denner den of militant eroticism. Loyalty is a deeply held virtue of mine, and I take it very seriously. Those I hold closest or keep in my inner circle 
are held to a higher standard than those who are on the outskirts. Two people can commit the same act, and the individual closer to me will be granted greater opportunity for my understanding, as well as greater punishment. In other words, a willful act of disloyalty will be punished. I had a fuck buddy that I enjoyed an emotional rapport with. Well, call him John. Besides the sex being wonderful, he satisfied a sense of intimacy that I sorely needed at the time of our friendship. I enjoyed our nights together immensely, and after a while, I started introducing him to my other friends with benefits. Other men I had an emotional rapport and sexual relationship with. I began to take him out to places with non-sexual comrades. I would let him stay at my house days on end. I brought him into my inner circles. The rule or expectation I tell those close to me, or that may be, or that may get close to me, is that omissions are betrayals, and I expect to know what is going on. Meaning, nothing better be hidden from me. I ask a question, I better get an honest answer. At some point, my libido began to wind down, and he became more of a cuddle buddy, which he didn't seem to mind. He was an avid cuddler. My libido is somewhat cyclical. Uh, where I go through a stretch of damn near celibacy, and others where I'm all over my men. One day I got a call from one of my guys who said that John had been chatting with him on Grinder and that he'd be up for three-way, but really had no interest in him without me being there. I was a bit put off because that was the first time I'd heard of it, and my bud was surprised I didn't know that John had been trying to go over to his and his boyfriend's house for a sexual rendezvous. I didn't think too much of it. I gave John the benefit of the doubt. Uh, perhaps because my libido was down, he wanted to screw the guys that I lavish praise on. And I can't blame him. The sex with them is great. But then I got numerous reports from other guys about this, and all were surprised that I had no idea about any of John's pursuits. So I confronted John, asking him why he never mentioned these hunts to me. His answer was only that I was jealous. So I explained to him about loyalty and my expectation of knowing when my buds engage. This is primarily because I like sharing my guys, I like facilitating these meetings, and I like talking with people about their sexual pursuits. When they don't tell me that they are sleeping with each other, or fail to mention it when we're all talking about it, it's like it's being hidden. So it's a requirement in my inner circles. I, become uh, I became furious with John, and I severed the friendship in a way I knew would hurt him. I became distant and cold. It's my go-to when I don't want to curse someone. But then John begins to badmouth me to my men and pursue non-sexual friends of mine, to which I told the latter friends that it's fine if they want to sleep with him. I'd be a hypocrite if I told them not to. And the sex was great. So due to my friend's sexual ties with John, I didn't curse him. Until they said they didn't care if I did or not. I had a few items around that belonged to John as well as some of his hair. And I decided that it was time to call on my dark comrades to aid me in punishing this traitor. So, on a night that was in accord with the type of working I wanted to do, I went into Ophelion, which is what I call my ritual chamber, and I called forth the powers of darkness. I proclaimed that the fires of my rage will consume him, and that my birds of hell are waiting, and their wings are on fire. A few weeks later, I'm walking into my home with a friend of mine, that was sleeping with John. He tells me that he needs to tell me something, that is, a, uh, uh, but is afraid of my reaction. I roll my eyes and I tell him that if he thinks I should know something, it's in his best interest to tell me because I'll find out anyways. He tells me, <laughs> he tells me John's house burned down. <laughs> I stop in my tracks and laugh so hard that tears trace the shit-eating grin I now wore. My friend says, that, that's the reaction I was afraid of. How can you laugh at that? <laughs> Still laughing, I just tell him, traitors must be punished. When I think about that, I still giggle. So, have a happy Halloween, and hail Satan. Really interesting <laughs> uh, story, Aden. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Aaron, we have a lot of listeners who have also had really successful destruction rituals. Let's hear from one now. I had a recent experience in which greater magic helped me a great deal. I consider it a successful magical working, so I wanted to share that. This was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I got a phone call from my 
daughter's social worker at school. And uh, she left me a voicemail, tried calling the school back. I couldn't get a hold of her. So I called my ex, uh, her mom, and just said, uh, hey, I got a call from the social worker. Uh, can you check this out when you go pick her up today? I'm not able to get a hold of them on the phone. So I was expecting that it was, you know, a fight on the playground or an argument or something, you know, kids doing kids. And uh, it was just, you know, I just went home, waited for uh, my ex to bring my daughter home. And uh, when she got there, she filled me in. Wished it was an incident in which uh, there was a fight or an argument or something. Uh, turns out that my daughter was sitting on the playground with a few of her friends and this car pulls up and these two guys get out, start walking down the sidewalk. And as they walk past my daughter and her friends, one of these guys says to the other, and excuse this, it's vulgar, I want to fuck one of those little girls in her pussy. This fucking piece of trash said, I want to fuck one of those 10-year-old little girls in her pussy. So my initial reaction was, is she okay? She was okay. She was a little bit shaken up. I was really proud of her for the way she handled things. She, uh, her first reaction was tell everyone that there's danger, get to the teacher and tell the teacher. The school handled it well. Uh, they beefed up security. They filed a police report. It went out in the PTA so everybody knew what had happened. And uh, that was all good. And I'm happy with that. And I, I have seen the added security since this has gone on. But... Uh, I was frustrated. It was mm. very frustrating, very infuriating, actually, because some piece of garbage said something very vulgar toward my daughter and her friends, my daughter being 10 years old. And the worst part of it was there was nothing I could do. It was, I was helpless. There was nothing I could do about it. So the first thing I did was made sure my daughter was okay racked my brain, tried to find out what can I do? There wasn't anything I could do. We had a vague description, very general uh, you know, characteristics. We couldn't really do much. Uh, the one thing I did do was uh, sit down with my daughter, made sure she was okay to do so first, but we, we pulled up the sex offender list for the county we're in and we went through all the pictures to see if there was anybody there that was, you know, that she recognized from, the, from what had happened. And there wasn't, so she was okay. She was a little shaken up, and uh, I was not okay. I was furious. There are a few things that will piss me off more than fucking with my family, especially my kids. And in this instance, at the very least, this was sexual harassment. So my 10-year-old daughter was now a victim of sexual harassment, and I had nowhere to direct all these feelings that I had about that. It was uh, you know, just this deep, black, guttural rage, just fury. So this is where Greater Magic came in. I, uh, had, after they were, they were in bed, I had the house to myself. I uh, went into the ritual chamber, did a destruction ritual, and I just poured out all the wrath malice, fury, hatred, everything that I was feeling, the fears for my daughter's safety. I just poured all of this toxic and negative energy into this ritual and found release. It gave me the uh, catharsis and intellectual decompression I needed in the situation. And the thing was that, that, that those feelings that I had, they were just blocking me up inside. I was, I was having a hard time getting past the situation. And, uh, you know, there's a, a LeVay quote that I always come back to in, in many situations, and that's, I break away from all conventions that do not lead to my earthly success and happiness. So yeah. anything that detracts from my success and happiness in life or would hinder it, I want to get rid of that from my life. And so these feelings that were welling up inside me were becoming consuming and detracting from my own happiness, my own ability to focus on uh, life and what I really needed to do. And just the, um, you know, the, the release mm -hmm. was really necessary. And the thought of throwing a curse at these two dirt bags and them suffering um, was very comforting in the situation. Even now, uh, when I look back at it and get worked up, the thought of them suffering 
preferably a slow death involving some form of genital mutilation is, uh, you know, still comforting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate you uh, contributing this story um, to this episode. I, I get, got a couple of follow-up questions, and it, you know, I, I have read all of the submissions to date. This one really, really struck a chord with me because, of course, as you know, I have a young daughter myself. Um, yeah. But uh, more than that, there's there's the and and I wanted to ask you specifically about this the structure of the ritual but then in some in a situation like this where the destruction isn't uh some planned uh contrived uh release of anger and rage this is something that you know it it it, it clouds your mind it, it you shake when you th- it, it's a rage that disrupts your ability to cope with life. I mean, you may oh, argue exactly. that that's why we do greater magic, why we perform greater magic in this way. But because it's such a sensitive topic, because it's such an emotionally charged um, cause, uh, catalyst for this greater magic ritual, did you find it challenging to control your thoughts for such a structured activity as a greater magic ritual and i guess the underlying question of this is did you follow the traditional greater magic ritual that you would find in the greater i'm sorry in the satanic bible or did you let your emotions guide the ritual so it was a little bit of both um i studied martial arts for many years so i learned to kind of remain in control of myself during that mm. time so you know you're in a situation that's difficult that's challenging you you can learn to uh kind of set your feelings aside and respond practically um you know and just be in control of yourself basically mm. so i knew i needed to go into the ritual chamber i need, knew i needed to ritualize and so i was able to go in and prepare and and get everything ready to go before beginning of of course once i started then yeah definitely let emotion you know just let it go and however however that needed to come out in the moment just let that happen um the second part of your question i do use uh generally speaking the um the rituals outlined in the satanic bible um there are some modifications that i do just for my own you know what moves me personally, yeah. uh, but I do follow all the the steps and you know, read the destruction ritual and Nakian keys and from the uh, infernal names. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just in in terms of conducting a ritual, I I've done a lot of them that are primarily compassion based, um, a, a lust ritual. I've done uh, I've conducted a, a destruction ritual, and I find that's the most challenging, because that's the one where I don't want to follow these guidelines as much. I just want to unleash what is inside of me, and it becomes so much more challenging for me. Uh, and I know some people uh, are very much strict in their heads orderly they must follow a b to c and some people are like there is no a b and c it's how you react and so i'm always curious on how other people handle it in those situations so that's that's really good um before i let you go uh, let me say a couple things one Thank you so much for uh, contributing to this episode. I think this particular story is incredibly important because you did not know directly your targets. You knew of them. And that, I think, for some people makes it a little bit more challenging because ultimately, I think, we want to see the results of the chamber uh, in the real world. And I think that's a hindrance for a lot of people. Um, and it may even be, and let me know, um, if it's easier for you not to know the target of your wrath uh, so that you're not checking in on it. Uh, how, how do you, how do you, what's your take on that? Well, um, I haven't done a lot of destruction rituals targeted at an individual. Uh, mm-hmm. When I've done them, it's been more um, targeted towards feelings or something inside of me that I wanted to, you know, take, destroy those feelings that were hindering me. Um, in this case, I did have a target that I, that I was, 
you know, had in mind. I didn't know exactly who they were, but actually there's something in the Satanic Witch that um, is perfect for this. It's uh, once your ritual has been performed, be satisfied that you have performed a powerful and well-planned working and have confidence that it will work. Then just sit back and wait for the results without continually thinking about when and how it will happen. So again, I just kind of take solace in that, um, in this situation that I don't have to sit around wondering and worrying about whether or not something went out and got somebody, you know, I just yeah. can focus on the fact that this was a successful working for myself because I got what I needed out of it. And anything beyond that is, is bonus. That's fantastic. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that it's a testament to not only um, the community and the school that your daughter is a part of, but more importantly, uh, your influence as a rational and uh, responsible adult that she acted the way she did in the face of something so uh, distressing and offensive. So, um, you know, fantastic job in raising your child. I think that's amazing. Um, Chris, thank you so much for this uh, story, for sharing your experience, and I wish you future successes in life. Oh, thanks for having me. Until we can chat again, my man. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. That was really, really tough to, to talk about with him, and it is, I think, a, a very important aspect of a destruction ritual. Whether or not you see the tangible results, and uh, whether that's important as part of the destruction ritual. What do you think, Aaron? Um, I think as part of it, but it doesn't, you know, it's not an integral part. It doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to see the result of a destruction ritual as long as, because as we've been discussing, it is all about you. So if you work this magic, you do the destruction ritual and it is done for you, it is over, move on, then it is a success. You don't have to see anyone rot in jail. You don't have to see anyone convicted of any crimes. You don't have to see the results necessarily to, to feel better. You know, the whole point mm -hmm. is to get this shit out of your head and move on. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason why anyone would ever, in my opinion, want to perform a ritual is because they, at their core, they want to see the results happen. Mm -hmm. They want, you know, it's not enough on the surface to just say it or just feel it. You want it to happen, especially if you're in that ritual, you have to own it, everything about it. And so for a lot of people, it's hard to break that, that mental framework after the ritual has been completed. You know, you, you're intellectualizing before the ritual. You get in there and you're screaming and you are clawing and you are destroying this individual. And then you get out of the ritual and suddenly you're supposed to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a hard thing to do. You know, we're, we're human beings. We latch on and we hold emotion. It's not hard to let go. And I know we have continuously spoken about the idea that if you haven't fully realized your and 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 shook loose that emotion in the ritual chamber, then you shouldn't even expect it to have succeeded. But you're still carrying around a little bit. You you just can't help it, right? Mm. Yeah. But I think we have to, you know, you intellectualize before. You go into the ritual chamber with, you know, exercising these demons and with the emotions. And then afterwards, you try to forget it. Um, and maybe that's it. Maybe you move on from that ritual and maybe you have to do another one. Maybe you have to follow up. Um, but, you know, you cannot become too absorbed with this other person because then it is, you know, it's moving away from you. And our, the most important thing about this is you um and if you're too concerned with that other person then you have to wonder why you know why mm -hmm. is it so important to you that this person that you see some results some some horrible things happening um you have to sort of reconfigure your expectations yeah that's really really nice um so we have some more here let's let's talk to another or let's listen to another listener uh, mm -hmm. and see what they have to say about this i remember it like it was yesterday it was the summer of 97 or 98 in the city of Orange, California. I was freshly single, having terminated a relationship with a girl who had violated our mutual agreement of exclusivity. When the relationship ended, she started dating my roommate. In order to help maintain my sanity, I moved from the apartment I was sharing in Costa Mesa with him to a new location. 
Eventually, though, he tired of her nonsense, too. Now, somehow, she had acquired my new telephone number. I didn't give it to my old roommate. And she started leaving messages with my new roommates to return her phone call. Regardless, I'd already had enough of her stupidity, and now I was at my wit's end because she got my new phone number. I decided to ritualize out my anger. Now, back then, understand, I didn't have the resources I do now because I was driving a tow truck for a living. I had to improvise, meaning my altar was my television set with my VCR sitting on top. So, I set up my room one night before going to sleep. And since I woke up before the sun rose, I set the alarm even earlier so I could give myself enough time to ritualize. When I awoke, the calm weather I had gone to sleep with had been replaced by hot and fierce Santa Ana winds. Now, while it says to shut out all the outside noises when ritualizing in the Satanic Bible, this was actually music to my ears, and it was a reflection of my mood. I got dressed, poured my elixir in the chalice, my used root beer since I did have to work later, lit black and white candles, and proceeded. Following the steps, I had written out my request on a piece of parchment, asking for this girl who was acting as a buzz killer in my life to be destroyed. While burning the parchment of the white candle's flame, I simply uttered out the words, I'm getting tired of this shit. Upon the conclusion of my ritual, I felt a charge coursing through my body. If this were an adrenaline rush, I would have known it. I felt that quite often. No, this was something far less describable, but no less intense. Needless to say, I felt mentally cleansed. Thoughts of my ex diminished from my head, and I got on with my life. I didn't tell anybody about the ritual I had performed. Exactly six weeks later, I visited some friends of mine, a married couple, at their apartment along with some other guests of theirs. I was talking to my friend's wife. She suddenly got excited about some news she had to tell me. She relayed the story that she found out from my old roommate that our mutual ex had returned to Arizona and moved back in with her father after he had broken up with her. When she got home, her father brought her a brand new Honda Accord. One day, while driving, she pulled out of a parking lot driveway and onto the street. What she didn't account for, though, was the oncoming traffic. Another vehicle, doing in excess of 40 miles per hour, collided with her vehicle perpendicularly, resulting in what we call a T-bone collision. Not only was the collision her own fault, she ended up with a broken collarbone, broken wrist, several broken ribs, and a concussion when her head hit the door frame for the Honda. She then attempted to get sympathy from my old roommate, probably because she knew I would not return her phone calls. He told her that he had just bought a house, was moving the next week, changing the phone number, and was moving in with another girl, and not to call him in the meantime. We never heard from her again. That's my little success story for, for my ritual. Hopefully yours has turned out just as well. Happy Halloween to everybody, and hail Satan. So what do you think, Aaron? We... Destruction is such a primal part of what it means to be a human being. It, it's it's one of our core emotions is hate. Uh -huh. So I, I've had people ask me before. Um, they've reached out and said, you know, this person hurt me really bad. I still love them, but I want them to be punished. You know, that, that Lex Talionis, they want revenge. They want an eye for an eye. They want to see something bad happen to them because they were hurt. Should you conduct a destruction ritual on someone that you may still have feelings for? I'm not saying this last listener did, but it inspired this idea. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's something you really need to figure out. I don't know. Um, I mean, sure, you can do that. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know if it's recommended because then you're afterwards, then you're wondering, then you'll be second guessing like, wait, did I really want the, the you know, as is written in the satanic bible and as we've been discussing you have to be pretty goddamn certain that what you're asking for is gonna be okay when you step out you know the that if you see results from what what you performed that you have to sort of accept those and so if you perform a destruction ritual on someone that you still have feelings for and then you know you start to see something awful happen to them how are you actually going to feel you know you have to mm -hmm. ask yourself these questions beforehand because yeah. if you're going to be conflicted afterwards then you're failing yourself in some way absolutely well magister harris has a really wonderful story uh and as always, a little side of humor with it. So let's see what he has to say. So, um, this is supposed to be about uh, greater magic. And I initially didn't want to do a piece on greater magic dealing with destruction rituals because uh, most of the other uh, denizens of the Fine Nine Cents podcast uh, were also doing 
situate you know we're describing situations of, of destruction rituals i guess we're just an angry bunch <laughs> we don't like a lot of people um but i i would have to say that uh out of all of the ritualization that i've done in the uh 15 plus years of my affiliation with this organization and you know going even back further beyond that just as a as a natural magician and satanist um destruction really has been where i have experienced the most success with my ritualization um i'd say lust i'm about 50 50 compassion i don't really have any of that um it's okay you can laugh it's fine it's funny. Um, destruction, I have that shit down. Um, but you have to read the fine print when it comes to a destruction ritual. And I suppose that's what I'm going to talk about, is that when you engage in destructive magic, you have to be prepared for any and all consequences. You really do need to examine all of the angles and all of the ways that this can affect you. This is probably, and I'm probably speaking out of my ass on this, but it's my personal opinion that this is where goofy Wiccans uh, get the idea of anything that you put out there comes back to you times three. It's not that it comes back to you. It's that the people that practice destructive magic don't examine all of the angles and that the nature of the right that they're trying to put on ultimately comes back to bite them in the ass because there was an aspect of destruction with regards to that particular person, place, or thing that they didn't take into consideration. And that's what happened to me in this particular case. And so I want to provide a personal situation, a personal tale, as a cautionary tale. Um, say tale again! Say tale one more. One more goddamn time! Um, I was working as a manager in a, uh, in a retail store, and I was fucking miserable. It was, uh, it was during a time when the economy was down. It was the only job I could find, and I was lucky enough to find a managerial position. Um, was not paying me very much. Um, the big boss was kind of a douchebag, and I did not like him. And as business you know, ebbed and flowed, uh, he would either become more or less of a jerk, depending on you know, which way the wind was blowing financially for him. Uh, till one day, I finally got fed up and said, I've had enough of this guy. I need to curse him. I can't move forward with all of this negative feeling towards him. So I throw a curse. I throw a curse on him. Throw a curse on his business. And like most of my destruction rituals, it worked. Now, here's how it came back to bite me. It came back to bite me twofold. Um, for starters, a week after I threw the curse, his father died. Uh, which kind of sucked because his father was a good dude. And I kind of felt bad about that. Um, he just was walking out of the warehouse one day, had a stroke, <laughs> fell down dead was dead before he hit the floor. Um, and I kind of felt bad about that because I liked him. I liked him. He was a good guy. Um, his son was a prick, but he was, he was a nice guy, and so I kind of had some guilt about that. Um, his father, however, was very much the backbone of that business, uh, ran the delivery aspect of the business, made sure everything ran like clockwork, and when he died, everything fell apart as in accordance with my ritual. Um, this of course culminated with the closing of the warehouse and the closing of the store that I worked in which again don't examine all the angles caused me to lose my job so yes my destruction ritual ended up fucking me because despite the fact that I had this all of this rage and this hatred I did not take the time to consider yeah, if I fuck this up and really put my energy into ruining this guy's life and business, it might affect me. <laughs> and it's something that we don't tend to think about because when you really do think about it, who do you really 
muster up enough hate and anger towards that you would willingly throw a death and destruction curse at somebody other than somebody who is so close to you and has such a dramatic impact on your life. You're not going to do that at the fucking guy who's causing a traffic pile up on the Belt Parkway. You're just going to be like, ah, this fucking douchebag. No, the only people that are going to inspire true hatred are people that are close to you. And people that are close to you have a dramatic impact on your life, whether you want them to or not. It's just the way things are. So when you engage in destruction magic, examine all of the angles. Make sure that there is absolutely no way that doing this will come back to bite you in the ass. Because if it does, you only have yourself to blame. And that was the case with me. I threw a curse, and it bit me in the ass because it worked. And it caused this person who I had this business relationship with to no longer have a business relationship with me that I, at the time, needed. Um, I was out of work for about a month as a result of that uh, little stunt I pulled. Um, But, you know, such is life and such is magic. So when throwing your ritual magic and your destruction magic, be aware of what you're doing and acknowledge that that magic has power. It's in the Satanic Bible for a reason. That your magic has power to affect not only the people around you, but you as well. So think before you curse, I suppose is the takeaway. I'm Magister David Harris, um, and uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Hail Satan. Now, Jesse did have a wonderful story. We're going to close out the destruction side of this with her story, and it is cold. So let's hear that. Hi, this is Jesse from I Dream of Jesse, and talking about greater magic today. Successes in greater magic. So I wanted to describe a destruction ritual, but I thought I should preface this by saying I don't do a whole hell of a lot of destruction rituals, and here's why. And this this is just a quirk about me. I'm not saying this is the way anybody else should be. It drives my husband nuts, in fact. I tend to let people take advantage of me and don't do anything about it. And that's, you're probably listening to that and saying, what? Here's the thing about it. If somebody screws me over, whether it's, you know, somebody I was becoming a friend of and and they screw me over, you know, somebody I work with who throws me under the bus if something goes wrong or, or, you know, just a company I buy something from and they ship it and it's broken and they won't replace it. I look at those situations and I think, okay, you know, this could have been a long lasting friendship or, you know, this, this coworker of mine has a different skill set from me and we could have really collaborated and done great things together and they've just cheated themselves out of that opportunity or the company, you know, I might've been a repeat customer or I might've recommended them to my friends and they just lost that opportunity. So when somebody screws me over, I tend to just automatically think of how they've screwed themselves over. Life is not a series of zero-sum transactions. I mean, there are some, but for the most part, it's you can go for win-win situations with just about every interaction you have with other people. And when people don't do that with me, well, they lose opportunities. So when somebody screws, and if they screw me over majorly, that might be different. But I mean, if it's like, yeah, I, I spend 20 bucks on something and it's broken and they don't replace it, that's I'm not going to spend an hour with their customer service department. I'm just going to say, okay, well, never shop there again. Never recommend them to anybody. They're the ones losing out because 20 bucks, I blow 20 bucks on a pizza every week. It's not that big a deal. So all that said, if I'm going to do a destruction ritual, it's going to be somebody who's really pissed me off. Um, and, and you know, never say never, but come to, I, I can't think back on any destruction ritual I've done where I've been the only victim. I think 
what brings out that that level of anger in me is when somebody screws over somebody I care about. You know, it's more of a protective thing with me. So the one I wanted to describe was uh, an old neighbor of ours. Um, we we moved in. We knew them before we moved in, and it started out, you know, as a, as a pretty decent relationship. Um, but come winter time, the uh, husband of their family was coming over into our yard and stealing firewood. Now, my husband is a logger, so it's not like we buy the firewood. He cuts it himself, splits it, stacks it, and we use that to offset the cost of heating our home. And this is a lot of time and effort on my husband's part. I mean, he, he tends to devalue his time and effort, thinking it's it's just saving money on, you know, because at, at, that, at that house we had electric heat, which is, you know, terribly priced. So... It's my husband's time and effort stacked up in the backyard that we're using for heat. And the neighbor is going over and stealing my husband's time and effort. And that's, that's, that's stealing his life. Your time is your life. I would almost rather the guy broke into our house and stole cash or something. I don't know. It's just, you know, because if he stole cash, then it would be more stealing from me. Because, you know, I, I make more than my husband. Stealing the firewood, that just, I, I, I don't know any other way to phrase it except he was stealing my husband's life. So, um, so I did a destruction ritual and, you know, outside the usual protocol for such a ritual, um, one of the things I did is I, I cut out like a, almost like a gingerbread man figure out of cardboard and... I chose to use cardboard because it's a paper product and it comes from trees and that seemed appropriate to me. Um, the guy walks with a cane, so I you know, cut out a cane for it. And I soaked it in beer and let it dry out because the guy's drunk. And so you know, once it's soaked in beer and dried out, it smelled of stale beer like him. Um, and then one night I performed the ritual. Uh, it was a cold winter night. We had the wood stove going. My husband had loaded it up with logs and went off to bed and I did my little ritual and opened up the stove and threw the little gingerbread man or the little cardboard man in. And the mental thought was that the, the, the blueprint for his destruction was I knew he felt guilty about what he was doing um because it, it, it's not like we stopped talking to him he kept coming oh he would deny it and you know try to be friendly with us and i mean he was stealing the logs and trying to like restack the logs in the pile so it wouldn't look like anything was missing but apparently there's there's a right and a wrong way to stack firewood i never had to do it so I don't know it but my husband would be able to tell immediately that something was missing because if you don't stack it right the pile will fall over um so I knew this guy was you know he if he if he was never speaking to us then maybe he would be snickering you know, laughing up his sleeve thinking he's getting away with something but he had to keep coming over and being nice to us and being the friendly neighbor and I knew that was probably driving him well hopefully driving him to drink you see uh since that was his coping mechanism for anything else that caused stress in his life so i was willing him to feel more and more guilty every time every piece of wood he took and to drink more and drink more and drink more so when i attended his funeral um and i did attend his it was a great thing first hearing that he died and then attending his funeral um and you might think well that's a bit weird to attend his funeral not at all because actually he was family I mean not a blood relation of mine it was through a few different marriages but you know if there's a, a wedding or a funeral it's the same group of people that get together and he was one of those people and you know all the people all the relations in between and there was no hypocrisy when I told the people that you know I'm sorry for your loss because I was, 
he was stealing from us. He was stealing my husband's life. But there were other people in the family who had other experiences of him. And for them, it was a loss. And when you go to a funeral, it's not so much for the person who died, it's for the survivors. So I did attend his funeral. I did express my sympathies to the people who were experiencing pain over it. I honestly think everybody is better off with him gone. I I would not have done the destruction ritual if I did not believe that. But I understand that other people may not have seen him for what he was, or they might not have, you know, my nieces were his nieces. They're kids. They don't know what harm he could have done because he, you know, they, they had nothing for him to steal, right? But I believe they're better off without him in their life. And, uh, yeah, I'm still feeling pretty good about that one. Hail Satan. Hiya, folks. This is Warlock M.A. Mandrake. How about that greater magic, huh? What with the destruction, the compassion, and the (laughs) lust. This is probably going to be less anecdotal than the other contributions to this episode. More of an overview of my experiments in greater magic. I hope that's okay with you. First of all, I rarely engage in formalized ritual these days. I usually prefer to go with the flow, seizing the right moment when it presents itself. I prefer to achieve an evocation whenever and wherever my emotions, environment, and circumstances align. Sometimes by design, but more often not. For more about this approach, I encourage you to read or reread Magus Anton Xander LeVay's essay, The Combination Lock Principle, from The Devil's Notebook. To me, that single essay is worth more than a library full of dusty grimoires. As for lust, compassion, and destruction, most of my greater magic doesn't fit neatly into those categories. Perhaps that's because for me, it's more about affecting myself than attempting to influence others. And yet, through what Magus Peter H. Gilmore calls self-transformative psychodrama, I bring the energy from my workings into daily life where it absolutely does influence everyone with whom I interact. But for all of my talk about focusing on my own mental state, I will admit that things do consistently happen when I put enough focus and energy into a working. People get back in touch, good news arrives, opportunities pop up, all after I have privately focused my energies into laser focus and without telling anyone about it. The most deliberate successes I've had with Greater Magic have been at work. I'm going to be vague here for the sake of privacy, but it would be disingenuous not to mention these examples. I frequently have access to stimulating environments and objects, including very old pieces of art depicting Satan from back when the church and superstition reigned supreme in the Western world. That adds a bit of oomph to my magical life. I have also taken advantage of uninterrupted moments in the presence of ancient magical artifacts. This provides me with many possibilities to derive magical inspiration from my surroundings. It's a great privilege, and I ain't getting no more specific than that, capiche? All right, moving on. My invocations among these relics and total environments have been a potent source of inspiration. This magnification of my will has helped me to earn multiple job promotions. I have exhibited a presence and focus that have set me apart from other contenders, getting me to the top of the list. Greater Magic has also helped me to work through frustrations with the job, sometimes with surprising results outside of myself. Again with the vagueness, I know. Sorry. But it's all good stuff. But enough about work. Let's get personal, shall we? Now, I get along with most people just fine. It takes a lot for me to make an enemy. And that enemy is invariably someone aggressively petty who repays my cordiality with staunch resentment for no good reason. I will admit that this isn't the worst kind of enemy. More of a nuisance. But when they cross me one too many times, I develop enough hatred to warrant a curse. And what do you think the result has been? (laughs) Satan, forgive me. These enemies have mostly been cursed with the burden of 
suddenly being much nicer to me. I know, I know. Might as well be a fairy princess with a magic wand that turns frowns upside down. But at least my life is more pleasant afterward. It's just not that cool. Okay, this one is a bit more impressive. One particularly egregious so-and-so pushed me so far that I repeatedly cursed this person with simple words and gestures just out of view and earshot. Almost every time I did this, they wound up damaging their own reputation within a few hours. That was all I needed. <laughs> the relatively tame results of my curses are examples of the balance factor in action. Just as LaVey points out that a homely individual can't expect to summon someone way out of their league, I'm basically not quite malicious enough to effectively wish a thoroughly doomy doom upon my occasional nemeses. What? You think this diminishes my satanic cred? I'll have you know that I am both aware of and true to my nature. I ain't wearing no stinking good guy badge, see? And I'll curse anyone who says otherwise. <clears throat> but moving on. The single most important element in my practice of greater magic from day to day is... Creativity. That's right. Certain creative acts have consistently resulted in more things going my way. My ever-evolving mastery of artistic materials and methods allows me to flow with the process, resulting in intellectual decompression. That, combined with a trance-like focus, makes a creative project a truly magical act for me. My demons, in the sense of inspirational seeds, have been summoned into material existence. And, as I mentioned, more things go my way. Seriously, I've compared the results to sitting on my ass like a lazy bum. It holds up. When I actually create something, though I may still be sitting on my ass, successes follow, even if I don't share what I've created with anyone. And when I do share them, the results are even better. Now that I'm done yapping, I'd like to recommend another essay to reinforce these principles, The Magic of Mastery, from the Satanic Scriptures by Magus Gilmore. And that's my nine cents on this topic. Have a magical Halloween. Until next time, this is Warlock M.A. Mandrake saying, Hail Satan. Thank you so much, Aaron, for joining me. I, I really enjoyed speaking about this with you. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts about this? Any last messages you want to bring out? No, I think this was just really, really fun. I'm glad I got to talk about it. It's not a subject that I discuss, you know, with anyone, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I can't remember the last conversation I had about greater magic, but um, it was really great. I had a great time. I think I learned. And the a lot. listeners, like their stories. <laughs> They're so great. Thank you it's guys so much. That, that's what really made it fun was hearing everybody's yeah. stories. Yeah. I mean, this is the fifth one that we've done. And so it's, you start to sort of find this pattern in your discussion, but having the contributors, uh, I'm sorry, the listeners and contributors mm -hmm. be a part of this, I think that's what really made it wonderful. And who knows, maybe next time it'll be a live show where we have, you know, people actually calling in and, and tuning in. Maybe we'll do it via YouTube like we've done in the past. But um, I think hearing how other people perform greater magic their perspectives on success and their the the weight that they put on the different parts of what makes greater magic i think is it's really special and so you understand that as everything with satanism it's really about the individual and that's really the discussion we've had so far so let me let me close down with this thought Greater magic is not a universally accepted or practiced principle amongst Satanists, and it is up to the individual Satanist whether they wish to engage in or explore greater magic. I would like to reinforce this personal note. Our founder and first high priest was a practicing magician. His first book, Codifying Satanism, the Satanic Bible, was composed half of Satanic philosophy and half of greater magic. 
His second book was The Complete Witch Defining Lesser Magic, and his third book, The Satanic Rituals, was entirely about greater magic. To ignore or shun these ideas as a Satanist, in my opinion, is nonsensical and to your individual detriment. We have tools that allow us mastery over our environment and the interactions within those environments. Why would you not take advantage of using them? If you would like to learn more about greater magic, I highly suggest the Satanic Bible and the Satanic Rituals. You could always listen to these Nine Cents Greater Magic episodes and try greater magic out for yourself. Just try it on for size. See Take what it out happens. for a spin. Yeah, you might like it. And you might not, and that's okay. For more information on Satanism or the Church of Satan, you'd do well to start with the Satanic Bible, Satanic Rituals, and churchofsatan.com. If you'd like to catch this Nine Cents podcast Every week, you can always find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, your favorite RSS reader, or just visit 9centspodcast.com. However you tune in, though, if you can, leave us a rating and review. And remember, 9 Cents is also in social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, MySpace, and Satanet. You can sign up for our email list, and you'll be updated about special 9 Cents events and episodes by visiting 9centspodcast.com. And until next week, I am your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by... Aaron. The beautiful witch, Aaron. It is such a pleasure to speak with you always. It's an honor. Well, until next time we can chat, and for the audience, until next week, hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. I bid ye rise and give the sign of the horns. Open wide the gates of hell. The lower heavens beneath you, let them serve you. Govern those who govern. Cast down such as fall. Bring forth with those that increase and destroy the rotten. No place, let it remain in one number. Add and diminish until the stars be numbered. Arise, move, and appear before the covenant of his mouth, which he hath sworn unto us in his justice. Open the mysteries of your creation, and make us partakers of the undefiled knowledge. Shem Ham Forash. Shem Ham Forash. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Thank you.